Today we'll be talking about the pinnacle of God's creative genius. Now, don't get me wrong, I did not say that God created us geniuses, but neither did he create us as robots. The material here in these early chapters of Genesis are so important because they are foundational. In that regard, this section and the truths that we encounter are critical to our understanding of all of the rest of the Bible and God's redemptive plan. They are key to understanding who God is and how God relates to man. They are key to understanding the nature and the seriousness of personal sin. Practically speaking, here you will find a key or a way to recognize the subtlety of Satan and also how to resist him. You also can learn how to recognize your own vulnerability in your own self-centeredness. We are going to be examining a series of first today. The first man, the first woman, the first encounter with Satan, the first sin, the first judgment, and the first gospel. This is a packed lesson. I could spend all of my time on probably all, any of these things that I just mentioned, any of these first I will mention. So we have to get into it real quickly. And I will not be reading the scriptures. They are printed on your sheet, but I will not be reading the scriptures today for the sake of time. Before we start, I want to point out to you the difference in the designation or um, the name of God in chapter, uh, chapter 2 and 3 and differentiate that from chapter 1. In chapter 1, we talked about last week how that word is Elohim. Elohim. In chapter 1 is the name of God that speaks of majesty and power. But in chapter 2 and 3, the word for God is Jehovah. Jehovah is the name of a personal God to whom one can relate. There are other names in Scripture attached to Jehovah. You may have heard them. Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Jehovah Nisi, God my banner. Jehovah Shalom, God my peace. Jehovah Shammah, God is with me. These names are of Jehovah are indications of the ways that God relates with man. Jehovah is a personal God. Elohim is the God of power and majesty. Same God, two different designations. Whenever you see the word Lord in Scripture in all capital letters, L-O-R-D, all caps, is uh, God, means God, uh, Jehovah, God. Like Lord God means Jehovah, the personal God. Well, God created the first man, Adam, and it was an intimate creation. Humans, mankind, shares many of the same internal organ systems and structures with the lower animals. And some similarities as far as physical frame is concerned. But there is a special sense that man is especially created by God. God indicated that this creation is special. He said, let us make man, how? In our own image. The creation of man is separated. It's separate from the creation of all other animals. They were created as a whole after their kind, whereas man's creation is individual and personal in the image of God. He first created the male in his image and then the female from the male's body. And he was created by the touch of God, touch of God. God formed man with his hands. 
This is distinct from all other things that he created, how? With his voice, he spoke them. This is a special creative work by God, intimate and personal. It was person to person creation. And then he breathed into him the breath of God. God gave him breath. When God created Adam, he breathed into his nostrils, his very own breath. This was CPR. If you want to think of it that way, it began the whole of mankind, the breath of God. The very breath that you have is from the breath of God. In a very real sense, when a baby takes that first breath, when he's born and cries out, that's God breathing into him or her. How intimate and personal is the creation of mankind. And then he created him in God's image. What does that mean? Well, first of all, man has a soul or personality. He has reasoning intelligence the ability to examine evidence, weigh possibilities, compare data, solve problems, appreciate thoughts and develop ideas, to understand and interpret languages and on and on it goes. Even to understand iPhones and how to use them. These are functions of intelligence exclusive to man. Now animals do have some intelligence some are more intelligent and can be trained more easily. Others are really dumb. They can communicate. They communicate with sounds like dolphins and whales and some other and, and ground, uh, land animals do too. But the intelligence of mankind is on a different plane. Generally speaking, the intelligence of animals is based on the trainability of that particular animal. You say an animal is smart if they can be trained to do certain things. Mankind is a trainer. To train them, the mankind attempts to train an animal beyond what is instinctual to them. Animals operate on instinct when you, their intelligence is based on how much you can train them above what is instinctual behavior. Mankind has emotions. That's part of the personality. The Bible describes God as loving. It also speaks of God hating, delighting, delighting in his creation. God made man in his emotional image. And God gave man a free will. God's power of free will was imparted to man. Man chooses, this is a basic choice in our lives, to choose to obey God or disobey God. Man chooses to believe God or to doubt. Even when we deal with other individuals, we decide whether to believe that person or not, don't we? We make a choice to believe God's word or to listen to other voices. We have a choice. And then also, we have a soul, but we have a body. Although the body of man was not in the image of God, since God is a spirit, God gave us a body that is erect with a certain dignity, a special dignity, to rule over the rest of creation. And it is perfect for the environment that we live in. It's perfect for this environment that we live in. The scriptures tell us that we are wonder fearfully and wonderfully made. And I find that to be so true. This body that God created for mankind is the body for the incarnation. Does everybody know what the incarnation is? Incarnation is God becoming man. This human body that God created was the tabernacle or the body 
for the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. This human body is special. It's suited. It was created with the time in history when God would become flesh, would come in the flesh. It was perfectly made to provide an earthly covering, a house, if you, if you want to think of it that way, for God. There is indication from Scripture that this is the body the Lord Jesus Christ will have for eternity. It is glorified now, but it's still recognizable as the body. Philippians 2, 7 said that Christ was made in the likeness of man. It's awesome. We were created in the likeness of God, and God came to the earth in the likeness of man. The fact that God would choose to relate so intimately and personally with man is way greater than I can comprehend, that I can think about, that I can even grasp or imagine. All I can say is awesome. God is awesome. Then mankind also has a spirit. This spiritual nature that mankind has is so that we can relate to God in spirit. We walk in the spirit, we worship in the spirit, we pray in the spirit. God speaks to us through his word into our spirit. We are unique spiritual creations. God's image is blurred in our day because of the Adamic nature. We'll say more about that in just a minute. Now we're going to look at Adam. Adam was created, and we're going to look at Adam's responsibility. He had a responsibility to tend the garden. They were placed in this beautiful garden, and um, it must have been pretty relaxing work because there would be no weeds. I, I don't know if he had to contain all that growth, but I don't think it was a problem. It was perfect, a perfect environment. And Adam was responsible to name the animals. Why did God have Adam name the animals? First of all, I think it was to educate him. When God paraded all the animals that he had created before Adam, just kind of paraded them before him, it was then that Adam got his Ph.D. in animal science, and he got it PDQ. He understood God through the things that God had created. Adam had perfect intelligence. His IQ would have been off the charts. He observed all the animals and named them in less than one day. And I think he, in, he to educate him, but also to help him realize his position and his responsibility. God wanted Adam to see that he was different than the animals, that he was a higher creation than the animals, and that he was to have dominion over them. And thirdly, C, is Adam was to realize that he needed a mate. As all the animals came before Adam, I'm sure he noticed with his perfect IQ, didn't take long for him to notice that they were paired. They were mated, but he was alone. There was no one else like him to be his counterpart. And then Adam was to rule over the rest of creation. It was Adam's responsibility to rule over all that God had created. Adam's environment was an enclosed garden in Eden. There have been many attempts to locate the Garden of Eden. And because of the names of the rivers, most Bible scholars think that it was located in modern-day Iraq, maybe somewhere close to Baghdad. However, because of the cataclysmic effects of the flood, it is impossible to know definitely where it was located. And when you get right down to it, do we really need to know the exact location? The word, the name Eden means park, conveys the idea of a peaceful place, doesn't it? 
What enclosed the garden is unclear. It was probably vegetation or growth so thick that it formed sort of like walls that made it impenetrable. So in effect, it would have been a walled garden. And it was prepared by man. God planned and he planted the garden for man. He personally arranged all the luxuriant vegetation, the groves of tall majestic trees, cedars and cypress, the orchards of fruit trees of every sort that bore fruit continuously. Beneath the trees, he planted beautiful ferns and shrubs that bloomed with magnificent flowers and bore berries. Along the expanses of velvety grass where the animals grazed all day, he planted flower borders along walks to be colorful and fragrant. The beauty and diversity of vegetation must have been incredible. There were herbs and fruit of every sort for man to eat. Can you imagine what the fragrance must have been intoxicating? It provided for all, provided for all his needs. Among all the other trees in this garden were two trees. God's special interest in man and his desire to relate to man was involved with those trees. The first tree, there were the two special trees were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life was not forbidden to Adam until after he had sinned. It is called the tree of life because partaking in it, the life that man now had, Adam now had, possessed, that he possessed right then, would be never ending. He would never end. The two trees represent a test for Adam that had eternal implications for Adam and for all mankind, whether Adam knew it or not. The first tree was the tree of life. The second tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was forbidden for Adam. You know, the actual fruit may have not been different than the fruit from the other trees. The sin which entered their being was not so much in what they ate, but in their choice to eat it or to disobey God in the eating of it. It was a choice to follow the wisdom of God or to follow their own wisdom and do not what God said, but to do what they wanted to do. Don't we still have that same choice? Of course we do. Almost every decision that we make. Do I believe and follow what God says? Or do I believe and immerse and follow myself, follow what I myself think to be right or what man says? At the risk of being too simplistic, I want to say that the more you immerse yourself in what God says, the more likely that what will seem good to you and right to you is what God says. You learn to do God's will by obeying God's word. God's will for Adam and Eve is that they would learn the knowledge of good and evil by knowing good and experiencing good from God's hands, obeying the good word of God and enjoying fellowship with him. Just like you recognize the false doctrine by knowing true doctrine, you recognize evil by knowing good. They were presented, this presented a choice for mankind, life and death. God told Adam that eating of the tree of good and evil was a death sentence. None of the creatures that God had created 
had experienced death at this point. Whether God had relayed exactly what death was to Adam is not clear. But it is clear that Adam knew what life was. It has always been God's desire that we choose life and obedience. This was a challenge for Adam. It was a challenge that Moses laid out for the nation of Israel in his, one of his last addresses to them. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day. I have set before thee life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Believest thou this? Jesus says, choose life. Choose life through obedience. Have you chosen life? You were born with a death sentence. Over, we were all born with a death sentence over our heads. When we believe, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did through his death and resurrection, we choose life. Have you chosen life? It's the same choice as was before Adam and Eve. Choose life, choose death. And I say to you today, choose life. If you have not made that choice, both Both of these were intended to be a blessing. Both these trees were intended to be a blessing for mankind. First, the blessings of eternal life. These are available to us today as we choose to put our trust, put our complete trust in Christ by faith in the gospel. And he also wanted them to learn the blessings of obedience. It was a moral test for Adam and for Eve which would develop and exercise their free will, their intellect, their emotion, and their love for God. By choosing to not eat, they would exercise their free will for God by choosing to be subject to him, by obeying him. They would have obtained the pers a personal knowledge of good and evil by choosing and knowing God. That is by exercising and developing their own likeness to God. That's this kind of like we choose to obey God and the image of Christ is formed in us today in the body of Christ. Okay, so now we have the garden. We have the creation of Adam and we have the garden, him in the garden and the trees and the test. And then God creates a woman, Eve. She was created for man. God saw all of his creation, and Adam alone had no companion of his kind. He was lonely. So Jehovah Jireh, the provider, provided a woman to complete the man. She was created from man. I've, I've heard this many times, that she was created from man's side to walk beside him not from his feet to be trod on by him, not from his head to be above him, but from his side to be his companion. She was created to be his counterpart, his counterpart, the other half of him, his helper and encourager and completer. She was formed from Adam's flesh, from his side, and they were one flesh. All right, now we have, we have the garden, we have the test, we have the man, we have the woman. And now we have our first encounter with Satan. Who is Satan? First of all, Satan is created, a created angel. Lucifer, he was a beautiful creature who led the angelic worship in heaven. But pride led to his downfall. At some point, he was lifted up with pride and began a movement in heaven to overthrow God and to be God. 
He led a rebellion of the angels in heaven against God. He was cast out of heaven and his recruits, he recruited others to, to do the same and they were cast out of heaven as well. His purpose is to oppose God and God's people. Satan is anti-God. What we see happening today to discredit God in the public forum is Satan's campaign. If you experience opposition, you know you're on the right track. If you stand for God in any way, you will be attacked. He is God with a small g today of this world. And he appeared to Eve in the form of a serpent. It could have been a dragon. He was evidently legged at eye level with her and he was evidently beautiful. He attracted her. And now let's look at, I mean, here's Satan in the body of a serpent and he tempted Eve. Let's look at this temptation. The first thing he did was caused her to, caused her to doubt God's word. First thing he said, yea, hath God really said? Hey, did God really mean it? Did God mean that literally? Number one attack today of Satan is to try to compromise God's word. Satan is still saying, yea, did God say? Did God really mean that literally? And, we, and this attack is, is evidenced by the various versions of Scripture, the paraphrases that are written by man. The attack on the first three chapters of Genesis that is everywhere. Can you take it literally? My son has a, a friend that he Facebooks with. I don't think he sees him anymore. He went to high school with him, but they Facebook. And this fella, I even forget his name right now. Kenny, I think is his name. But he's... Um, Christian, says he's a Christian, but he doesn't believe the first three chapters of Genesis, literally. He believes they're myth, allegory, a story, sort of like the Greek mythology and Roman mythology. He says Adam is not a real person, that Adam is like a myth. So Satan has been successful, so successful in getting people to say first three chapters of Genesis are myth they're mythological so Satan caused her to doubt God's word the second thing he did was cause her to doubt God's love God's love it's like he was saying you know if God really loved you he wouldn't withhold a thing from you he would withhold nothing from you he turned her attention to the one thing out of all the garden, the very one thing that God had said you can't have. All that he gave him, he created for us, I wish I had it syndrome. Still exists today. All the blessings that God have given us, we disregard those, I wish I had that one thing. And then Eve perverted God's word. Eve perverts God's word. She misrepresented what God said. God told them to eat freely. When Eve talked to the serpent, she left that out. God told them not to eat of the tree. Eve said, we're not even to touch the tree, when she replied to Satan. Now, here's some stern warnings for anybody. There's stern warnings in the scripture not to add or subtract from the word of God, and Eve did both. When we attempt to alter God's word to suit our situation, that puts us in dangerous territory, and it's done all the time. 
Then Satan puts this thought in her mind. You can disobey God and get away with it. God's going to look the other way. He really didn't mean to sound so stern. He didn't mean you would really die. Until till now, death had no meaning for Adam and Eve. They had never experienced it, never seen anybody else experience it, except those animals that God had killed to make the covering for them. The devil caused Eve to lose her healthy fear of disobeying God by suggesting that God would not really punish her. Many people say today, and you hear it all the time, if God is a loving God, how could he send anyone to hell? They live their lives based on that fantasy. And then he excited her ambition to excel and to be special. He dangled that forbidden fruit in front of her like it was a jewel, something of incredible value. It would make her wise, and she would know what God knows. God doesn't want you to have this knowledge, Eve, but you can have it. It's yours for the taking. Possibly Satan's greatest temptation is to the ego, the self, to make somehow make ourselves better, smarter, prettier, sexier, or even more desire and even more desirable as a friend or a lover. This selfish ambition has led many women on a path of sinful, self-destructive habits that leads to personal despair and ruin. The forbidden fruit is the most attractive and the most destructive fruit. And Eve ate that forbidden fruit. She took from Satan's hand what God intended to give her as a result and a reward for obedience. And so we see the first sin. Eve's choice was she listened and she dwelt on the thoughts of what was forbidden by God. Temptation is not a sin. It's important to distinguish that. Temptation is not a sin. But when Satan or anybody else begins to question or compromise what God says, that's the time to skedaddle and get out of there. But Eve hung around and she entertained in her mind what he was saying. Faith gave way to doubt when she turned over in her mind what he was saying. She got her mind involved, and he has her mind at that moment. Then she looked, and she chose to continually gaze on that that was forbidden by God. She chose to concentrate on the thing that God forbid. She was blinded to all that God had given her, all the many blessings, and she put her full attention in the one thing that God prohibited. When she continued to look longingly on what God had forbidden, she sinned in her heart. So God, he had her mind, he had her heart. She took possession of what was forbidden by God from Satan's hand. Satan had her will. She tasted and took into her body what was forbidden by God. She sinned in her body. Satan had her body. Isn't it interesting? He first appealed to her ego. She became self-centered. What I want, what I want to become. Satan elevated her pride. He said, you're going to be special. You're going to be special. You're going to know what God knows. So now Satan has her mind, her heart, her will, and now her body. And then she gave the thing that God forbid to someone else. She gave it to Adam. It's been said that no one ever sins alone. Personal sin always has an effect on those who are closest to us. So Adam took, also partook of the thing forbidden by God. Adam's choice, Satan did not tempt Adam. Satan did not tempt Adam. He let Eve do it. She gave to Adam. 
Satan turned Eve into the seducer. Seducer. Adam was not deceived. He sinned with his eyes wide open. Now, it is possible that when he saw the woman whom he loved in her fallen condition and knowing there was no way to reverse or to restore her innocence, he deliberately stooped down to where she was to become like her. And in this case, Adam's sin was more serious than Eve's. He followed his heart into sin. He loved Eve more than he loved God. So Adam partook of the fruit. He was the responsible party. He had failed to protect his wife and to lead her. 1 Timothy 2.14 said Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now we're going to look at the unity of the human race. All humans are descended from Adam physically. Physically. We're all we've got is DNA in our cells. May be very minute by now, but the, our bloodline goes back to Adam. All humans are descended from Adam spiritually, physically and spiritually. Since Adam was made in the image of God and we are all descended from him, we share the same spiritual nature. Adam is the head of the human race. As the first man and as responsible as the father of mankind, so to speak, Adam is the head. His actions will affect all those who follow him. When we are born, we are born in Adam because of Adam's sin, and we're in Adam, we bear the image of Adam. Well, there were immediate consequences to sin. Adam and Eve's eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. They saw themselves as being uncovered and undone before God. And they recognized their guilt. And they covered themselves. They attempted to cover their guilt with, what, fig leaves. They had lost their garment of righteousness that God had given them. They lost their innocence. They were guilty. And they concealed themselves from God. They hid from God. They tried to escape from facing responsibility for their actions. You know, people, even Christians today, attempt to hide from God in a whirlwind of activities, pleasure, noise, to drown out the voice of God calling in their consciousness. I'm amazed at the lengths that people will go to to run from God to hide, attempt to hide from God. And they cringed in fear. Sin brought a sense of insecurity to them. But they refused to accept responsibility for their actions. It's interesting, Adam blamed Eve and God. He said, this is the woman you gave me. And Eve, of course, blamed the serpent. Today, people blame their parents their background, their doting parents, or their, their um, absent parents, or their uh, neglecting parents. They blame the hypocrites in the church. They blame their own personality. Well, you know how I am. They blame anything rather than ex accepting responsibility for their own sin. There is no real repentance if you even partly blame somebody else. You must take responsibility for your own sin before God because you will answer for it. Well, there are consequences immediately and there are also lasting consequences for sin because as a result of this sin, it plunged all future mankind into sin. Paul reveals this in Romans 5 and 6. He said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered to the world, death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We are sinners in Adam. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more 
They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So death plunged all mankind into sin and death reigns. Because of Adam's sin, we died spiritually immediately. He died spiritually immediately and eventually he died physically. Since we are in Adam, mankind dies physically when a baby comes out of the womb, he begins to die immediately. We don't like to think about it, do we? That this child is just, who's just born is going to die. It's hard to think of it, but it's true. Because we are in Adam, we die. Because we are in Adam, we, we are dead spiritually. We are dead in trespasses and sin. And we will die eternally. The second death if we stay in Adam. The good news is that when we trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pass from death to life. We are taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. The curse of death is removed and we gain eternal life. Adam's curse is broken by grace. Now we're gonna look at the first judgment it's important to realize that the curse of the serpent goes beyond the reptile to Satan himself. God said the reptile will crawl on the ground and eat dirt, dirt, and that seems to apply to the reptile itself. Perhaps Satan thought that since he had control of the woman, he was the one and she was the one that would bear children to populate the earth that he would control the powers of human reproduction. In, he, in his evil mind, he may already have had a multitude of, of obedient servants birthed through Eve. But God had an answer for any such ambitions. He put enmity between the woman and Satan, and she would despise him and desire only her husband. And he would, there would be an enmity between the woman's seed and Satan's seed that would ultimately lead to Satan's destruction. The judgment of Eve was a uh, judgment. It was not technically a curse. Satan is cursed. There is no hope for Satan. And the ground is cursed, but mankind is judged and condemned by God. But there is hope. There is hope for a Redeemer to rescue from this condemnation. Woman's judgment has to do with reproductive processes, painful periods in childbirth. She is to be under the leadership, the headship of her husband. The judgment of Adam is that the curse of the earth would bring hardship for her war. He would have to work by the sweat of his brow he would no longer have access to the abundance of the garden. Uh, he would have to work hard to make things grow. And mankind would die physically, and his body would return to the earth from which it came. And death. They were banished from paradise. They were kicked out of the garden. They could not get to the tree, the tree of life that was meant for them to eat from. They lost life by choosing death. And also we see the first gospel. We see the promise of the seed of woman. That seed of woman refers to Jesus Christ, one who was virgin born of the seed of woman, not the seed of man. In the Bible, when seed is mentioned, it always has to do with men. Only here is the seed of woman. It's unique. It's without a man conceived through the Holy Spirit. This was a deliverer, promised deliverer from Satan's tyranny. He would defeat Satan with a fatal blow to the head. Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross. And this is all based on 3.15, Genesis 3.15. And write that down on your sheet right now beside this, Genesis 3.15. And go back and look at this, okay? would defeat Satan with a fatal blow to the head, he would crush his head. 
Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross. However, like physical death from original sin, the final defeat of Satan is delayed in God's timing. We have the promise in the word that Satan will be completely and eternally defeated. Throughout the Old Testament and continuing into the New, there are two distinct lines of humanity. The seed of the woman, which eventually leads to Christ, and the seed of the serpent, which includes all those who reject God and leads to eternal damnation. And there is the promise for the covering for sin. The shabby attempts by this couple, couple, Adam and Eve, to cover their own sins was replaced by God, who shed animal blood and made coverings for them. This was the first death in Scripture, the first picture of what God did on the cross when he shed the innocent blood of Christ was so that they might give a covering for the sin of this couple, that he might cover them with his righteousness. It's a picture, the first picture. And then we have the promise of eternal life. When we place our faith in Christ, we are given eternal life. In heaven, in the final chapters of Revelation, we see the tree of life once again center stage, and we may eat freely forever. The tree of life stands in the center of heaven. So how do we wrap this up? How do we wrap up this packed lesson with so much going on? Well, I've just got a few questions. Are you thanking God today for the abundant blessing, the blessings that you're experiencing, or do you focus on what you wish you had? Are you experiencing that I wish I had syndrome? Whose voice are you listening to? When faced with the choice, do you remember what God says? Or do you turn your attention to other voices? Who has your attention? It matters. It really matters who you listen to. Your choices matter. Your choices affect your relationship with God. It affects your relationship with others. It affects your peace of mind. It affects how you go about your daily activities. It affects, it affects how you think in every area of your life. Whose voice are you listening to? Are you hiding from God as a result of disobedience? If so, if that's your case today, today, Accept responsibility for your actions. Repent. Change your mind about what you're doing, what you've done, how you're thinking, the choices you've made in the past, and turn from them. And just pray, God, help me to make the choices, by list, the right choices by listening to your voice. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this lesson. It was so full. I feel like I really didn't do it justice. I feel like I hurried through some parts where I should have slowed down and talked more. But Lord, I just pray that you'd use it. Use it in the lives of these women. Use it in the lives of those who are listening online. Lord, I, I lift them up and pray that you would help them be consistent in with their lessons and put the word of God in all of our hearts. Help us to listen to what you're saying through your word. Help it not just to be an uh, exercise in putting words on paper. Help us to put those words into our hearts so that they will work out in our character, just like we said earlier, that it comes into our minds and into our hearts and then works its way out in our character. Lord, help us most of all to be obedient, to listen to what you say, and to obey you with a heart of love, 
and a heart of desire to please you above all things. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.